So you're a mutant with the Myers Briggs thing. Yeah, mutant with Myers Briggs. Do you, so you don't have an. Uh, uh, but a... then I took it again, and I can't remember what I was. Remember, I was, uh, e maybe ENFP. That's me. Maybe. Are you just guessing? Because you're getting my hopes up. It's been like a long time now since okay. I took it. I mean, it's probably changed since then too. Wait, do, do they change? I think I people change, right? Yeah, but people evolve over life, and you you get in these habits, and you turn. That's into interesting. A different person. I wonder if that yeah, if the Myers Briggs does like it, your whole core changes at some point. Wouldn't that be interesting to like see how much you actually change over yeah. time? Well, I guess like, if you just take over... the, you take the test a bunch of times. I took it twice. Yeah, well, we look up what it is because I'm ENFP, which okay. means I'm extrovert. Um, I forgot what the word is, but extrovert definitely, obviously. Yeah. And I want like people to come together and energy to come together and, and make connections and stuff like that. Yeah, that's all you. Yeah, that's me. Yeah. But you're extroverted too. I think you, what, it's more like you, you're extroverted when you want to be, and then you can chill and not be extroverted. I think that's why I ended up in the middle is because I'm really happy being out with my friends and stuff. Yeah. And then I'm happy to be like in bed in a book or streaming a totally. show or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like it doesn't bother me. Although I find if I'm like not doing stuff and like not streaming something or whatever – and I'm just like hanging out. I do get kind of get like this existential doubt all the time. Like I'm just a fuck up. I'm just terrible in my Whoa. life. I just am not good at things. That's like an inner dialogue. That's like a comic book. Yeah. <laughs> you got a little word bubble. I it's... got a little devil on my shoulder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're like, uh, Jason, what are you doing? <laughs> J or, no, Jason thinks to himself. J he doesn't. He's he's unsure of the world and his place in it. <laughs> Who is it? Yeah, right. Who, who is Jason? Who is he? He's By just, the way, we he, have Jason Sachs here. Hello. Who are you, Jason Sachs? I'm just some guy, you know. You're not some guy. You're an author. I am an author. So I've written a bunch of comics history books. A new one, uh, The American Comic Book Chronicles of the 1990s is going to be out in uh, September from Tomorrow's Publishing. September is soon. September is very soon. On the on the Amazons, right? It's on the Amazons, on the Barnes and Nobles, hopefully in some of your local bookstores. Ooh, that'll be fun. Comic shops. Uh, you know, the, in Seattle here, we have the Amazon that is a bookstore. It is a bookstore and a lot of, it's the everything store. Yeah, we could go there and see your book on the shelf. I, I Okay. Let's was, do it. That'd be cool if it was actually on that shelf. Well, it should be. I saw. I, I found my book on a few shelves, actually. That's cool. So I, I wrote uh, also the, the 1970s book is part of the same series. Okay. What's that called again? The American Comic Book Chronicles. Bam. So there's a series of books that are the decade-by-decade decade history of the American comic book industry. And right now they, stand, they go from the 1950s to the 1990s. 1990s is the one we just finished. Um, and I wrote... Some or all of three of them. So I guess I consider myself like an expert on comics history. Yeah. Everyone's got to be an expert on something. And uh, I'm so excited about the 90s one. It's such an interesting time. Yeah, it was. And I mean, I think a lot of uh, people listening and watching uh, grew up in that time with comic books. And it was just such a, yeah, an energy about it. Like there was energy around different eras in comic books, as you know, because you write about them. But I feel like there was just so many different new publishers and artists and things just like exploded i feel like there was something special that started around 1990 that just kind of blew up the comics industry so for a long time it was like this kind of sleepy industry that people never paid that much attention to um then like secret wars came out mm. a lot of people love secret wars mm -hmm. so like crazy numbers and it like became this this thing and then not too long after secret wars came out ninja turtles came out the earliest Ninja Turtle you mean comic. Eastman, Eastman? Eastman yeah, and yeah. Laird. Mm -hmm. Ninja Turtles number one was like this blockbuster that came out of nowhere. Just the, the title alone like sparked all this interest and stuff. Yeah. And just blew up. Eastman and Laird were just these couple of guys, basically just some drinking buddies who were like teenagers who were like basically. They were teenagers? <laughs> at least in their early 20s. Okay. And they came out with this comic that was a parody of all, of Frank Miller's uh yeah, Dark Knight, Dark Knight so Returns. Like yeah, totally. And there's all these parallels in there to Miller's career. So like Miller's Daredevil was about uh the Hand Clan. So that's why in uh, Ninja Turtles you're the Foot Clan. 
Oh, oh, and there's all this parody of like Miller's being this pretentious artist guy, and that's why they're Michelangelo and Donatello. That's because crazy. it's like they're all making fun of him being yeah. like, this pretentious artist, and then Splinter's training him because uh, Daredevil trained with stick that Frank Miller created. So there's all this Splinter direct of lines stick. of stuff, and so the early Ninja Turtles comics sold like phenomenally. Like they came out in 1988, and the first few issues were like selling for hundreds of dollars an issue, like months after they came out. So there was this enormous bout of amount of attention paid to comics in '88, and that triggered this big black and white boom, and then bust very quickly. Like people were coming out with these terrible, shitty black and white comics, and mm. the industry went through this real quick boom and bust. Like literally, there was one month there were like 200 black and white shit comics out oh, there, okay. and there was adolescent. Uh, blue jean kung fu koalas koalas and there was miami oh, no. mice which is a miami vice i actually remember takeoff. miami mice I think it's I'm... actually not terrible yeah um that's interesting that it was like i you saying that like changes my view of that time period because i didn't think of that like as a parody uh-huh yeah you know i mean i just thought it was like a, another new thing that was weird kind of like because i like anime like oh now it's turtles that are like being weird but it but you saying like, oh, comparison, this to this, stick to Splinter. That's really interesting. A lot of people don't know this stuff, and it's yeah. kind of cool that they don't because in a way it's like the secret secret handshake in a way that people know about. Yeah. But it just makes it more interesting in a lot of ways because this turned out to be way bigger than the subject. It was satirizing. It became this enormous thing by the early 90s. And Eastman and Laird, who were just a couple of guys who, they borrowed the money to publish a small press comic from their uncle. Two grand or something. And ended up becoming this thing where by the early 90s, they literally had money to burn. Yeah. And they burnt it. So, um... Eastman created a company called Tundra Comics in 1989. If you know the story of Apple Music, mm-hmm. where basically it was about John Lennon and, and Paul McCartney giving away money, that's basically what Tundra Publishing was. Oh. So like it was founded on this whole idea of having no editors. So they'd pay these enormous advances to the obscure creators and say, okay, publish your prestige book. Uh, adaptation of Peter Pan, which they don't have a prayer of selling more than like a thousand copies of, but they advanced this guy, Craig Hamilton, thousands of dollars to produce it and said, we're going to publish this on the most beautiful paper and it's going to be a hardcover. It's going to be a classic for generations. And then Hamilton just never finished it, but he pocketed the money because he got this huge advance. So I'm guessing Tundra was done in Tundra, very quickly. Tundra was dying about, dead in about two years, but there's this old comics journal interview with... Uh, with Eastman that talks about basically that same story. It's almost like John Lennon talking about being there during Apple music and people being part of people literally carrying out bundles of money. Yeah. I mean, they expanded to produce hundreds of of comics. They bought a recording studio. They created, uh, uh, studios in England and in Massachusetts and all this stuff. And then, the company just completely collapsed because they didn't sell anything. Yeah. None of their comics ever broke the top hundred. It's funny how people like take one thing and they're like, okay, this is, this is it. Right. And they just like throw all the eggs in the basket. They're yeah. Like this is it. Like, let's just go all in on this. What What's hilarious is it didn't actually affect them that much because the guy still was making crazy money from the Ninja Turtles because they right. owned all the IP to it. Wait, did they own the IP for the game? So when I remember the Turtles, I remember the book or the graphic novel or whatever. Were they comics separately? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. But I remember the graphic novel for some reason because, like, they did a trade of it or something. Yeah. I remember that. Then I remember the Palladium is a role-playing game company. Mm -hmm. They make great RPGs, like uh, RPG uh, role-playing games. I just said that twice. <laughs> We've had drinks. They people. are role playing games. They are role playing games. Role By the way, games. if you're not sure about it, <laughs> they are also role playing games. No, but Sometimes like um, known as RPG. There's so many that they made, and one of them was the turtles. Uh huh. So like literally, we could role play turtles, and that's what I remember. I wonder if he has a piece of that. He got a piece. They of have that. everything. They have a piece of everything. Yeah. Because they even still to this day, it's copyright Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird. Wow. Those movies, then all the movies and everything. Yeah. 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 There's, we need to make something that we get residuals on right? Jason Sands. It's the fucking luck of the draw, though. It's the total luck of the draw. So this is one of the small stories of the 90s. Like, no one knows these stories. Yeah. But Wait, are they in your book? They are in the book, yeah. Oh. But, like, there's a whole book to be written about just the just uh, yeah. Tundra Publishing. I, I've said it before to you, because we've had many discussions off a of podcast, and I really think that a movie needs to happen 
a documentary or just a recreation reenactment movie of this time period because it's such an awesome, crazy time period, 90s and comics. Um, I want to see more from it. You know, like I want to see visual from it. Yeah, it's such an interesting time. And like people just, when it was happening, you had no, no one ever thought it was strange, really. So like 19, well, I was starting to talk about 1990. So Todd McFarlane's Spider-Man comes out. Right. That uh, changed my life, by the way. A lot of people love that comic so yeah. much. It sold two million copies, which now is like insane numbers, like unbelievably great numbers. Let's break it down for a minute, though, because what was it? Because I was part of that two million number, uh -huh. and I remember the art style being like crazy to me for some reason. If you go back and look at it, it's not crazy, but it definitely was like super detailed or something. I don't know what something about that style made me feel like, wow, this is something I haven't seen before. Because the writing wasn't like what drew me in. Not to be, you know, no taking away yeah. from it. But it was more like this creative, weird style that really is what spoke to me. You it's, know what I You know, it wasn't like another Spider-Man. You know what I compare those early artists to is like hearing something like the Red Hot Chili Peppers for the first time. And you're like, this is like really cool and different and just kind of blows my head off. And like... The first time you might have discovered them when they were the first big thing. And I realize that's a dated reference, but yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. You can compare it to, I don't know, Drake or something, right? <laughs> I don't know if you can. I can't. Okay. Maybe you can. Well, I love Drake, Maybe but you can. anyways. Uh, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Like the first time you discover this band that like totally resonates with you, and that's all they, all you want to do is hear their stuff because it sounds so clever and interesting and original. Yeah. McFarlane just had this style that was fresh and yeah. fun and detailed, but also had this kind of looseness to it. And his personality came through. So it was both totally professional and totally like his own thing. And like all the people who came through at the same time, you know, everyone talks about Rob Liefeld. Oh yeah, who couldn't draw feet, and he was like this awful, awkward. He was artist. a weird artist, but like he drew whatever he wanted, and people loved because there's this amazing energy. He to did it a right. lot of Shatterstar, is that right? Shatterstar. <laughs> Shatterstar was his character. Yeah, yeah, I remember Shatterstar. He created uh, Cable, and what everyone knows him for is Deadpool. Wait, yeah, Deadpool, but didn't Shatterstar in the movie just die immediately? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it felt the so worst. bad for him. Yeah, the worst. He had like crazy hair and like just died immediately. <laughs> That the Deadpool movies are so good. Yeah, they Gosh, are. Gosh, damn it. Yeah, they're so good. Uh, well, I'm excited about your book. What's it called again? The American Comic Book Chronicles, of the 1990s. And it's out now. It will be out not too long after this hits the streets. <laughs> Which is what all the kids say. <laughs> hey, when's Thank your you. podcast Thank dropping? You. Yeah, it hits the streets on Tuesday. <laughs> this will hit the streets tomorrow on Tuesday, so it won't be street out. Street date. Street date. Street September. Date. You get the you get the publicity emails. It's always street date. It is street date. Uh, we'll look for that, and I definitely want a visual video re representation of what you, we just talked about, because I really think it would be amazing. That um, hurts what all the kids say. Tell me again how old you are, Carlos. I'm younger than you, <laughs> but not by much. People listening might not know, but I'm definitely older than I think. Than I like how you always bring I'm. that up in a lot of your podcasts. What do I, up that my age? Yeah. Because you're older than me, and you're like, this kid, he doesn't know what I'm talk <laughs> he's talking about. Yeah, right. Uh, before I forget, because we're here on the video podcast as well, for you listeners, if you want to listen or see the video, go to youtube.com slash C slash a lot of things. I know the C is weird. It means channel. I can't change it. That's how it is. Slash C slash a lot of things. And you can see the video. But the Springfield, Com Springfield Confidential by Mike Rice book that I'm holding up is fucking incredible. Uh, the full title is Joke, Secrets, and Outright Lies from a Lifetime Writing for The Simpsons. He goes into the original creation of The Simpsons with Matt Groening, as well as just his experience of kind of infighting and, you know, all the stuff that happens when you make an incredible show that has millions of followers, and it's amazing. So uh, Judd, Judd Apatow actually writes the foreword, which is cool. Cool. Uh, so I, I urge everybody to go check this book out. And like I said on an earlier podcast, it's an easy read. <laughs> it's not difficult. You were reading earlier. It's like easy yeah, to read. It's just fun. Yeah. Well, that's one of the things I found about writing about the 90s, like how big The Simpsons was. I forgot about that. How'd you it forget about it? It was everywhere. It was. It was everywhere. Hats, yes. McDonald's. I must have had a dozen of those stupid bootleg shirts. Oh, yeah. They're all like Rastafarian ones. Yeah. Take it easy, man. Eat my shorts Eat my and shorts, I'll smoke dude. a doobie, dude. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Uh, let's talk about, uh, what do we want to talk about next? Because this is just a loose, we're, we're flying loose and gloose, which <laughs> is not a word. You were talking about structure 
Really oh, I know our structure's out the window. You know, we can be as structured as you want. Well, we're talking about comic books. Uh, I like comic books. You write about comic books. I wanted to hear a couple of stories uh, real quick, because we talk a lot about stories that you have of interviewing people in the comics industry. Uh-huh. You, know, you know, a lot of like interesting personalities. Like maybe pick one that we've talked about even that it makes a good story uh, for the podcast listeners. You've talked to a lot of really interesting people. Sylvester is one and some other people, Sylvester right? Sylvester was great. Yeah, so Sylvester, I met him at the first Image Expo. So Image Expo is this basically now a press show where the image creators come up and talk about their new projects. But the first year was the 20th anniversary of Image. They just basically had a convention and brought the creators in. So Sylvester was just so chill, just such a great guy. You know, um, I showed up late to, for my interview, and I sit down at the table with him and his his uh, his guys, and he's like, do you want a drink? And I'm like, yeah, yes, sure, I'll I take do. some water. Okay. He's like, no, do you want a drink? Because we drink. My studio drinks. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, whatever he's having, I'll have. So what was it? Me, it was a nice scotch. It was actually right, a really right. smooth, nice scotch. And then Sylvester was just the most chill guy. Just a really nice guy who obviously is someone who like had lucked into this amazing lifestyle because his wife was just drop dead gorgeous and super. Which you've sweet mentioned before. Nice. I remember that. Yes. Yes. yes, yes Bridget yes. Silvestri, winner. Winner is what they say on the streets, by the oh way. All you the are, kids you are all over me on the All the you? kids on the streets. <laughs> when they're the talking kid, about ladies, what the kids they are say, saying. She's a winner <laughs> in the forties <40s> voice. <laughs> They say, she, hey, you look at that dame over there. She's a winner. I'll be off you on that. Real quick. What, 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 do, you, what do you say? No, I'm not saying anything. I am older than you, yeah. Uh, Sylvester was cool. I like that when you meet people who you respect and you like their art and stuff, that they're cool. Like, Because that doesn't always happen. It doesn't always happen. So, like, Name a story you met someone you didn't like. So I, inter- not, I, don't want to make I interviewed a guy named Jeff Darrow. Who's, uh, well, there's his name. <laughs> there you go. I, I could tell a story about him. Um, he interviewed, or he drew um, a comic with Frank Miller um, called, uh, shit, now I'm forgetting the name. But anyway, he did a comic with Miller. He also did a comic called Sholin Cowboy, okay. which is a really great kind of, so he's famous for these very detailed um, drawings. They're just incredibly rich and complex with these various kind of otherworldly images. So I met him twice. The first time I met him was at a convention. Go up and he's got prints. Um, and I'm like, oh, nice to meet you. Here's $20. I'll buy a print from you. Uh, will you sign it for me? And he, without saying a word, grabs the print and just starts drawing. And he just draws and draws and draws and draws. Never says a word to me. Draws this bizarre floating whale on the edge of this picture of Sholin Cowboy, who's this like ninja cowboy uh, weird creation, Mm -hmm. and just hands it to me, and it's like, just waves his hand, and we're done. Okay. That's it. Okay, well, that's a cool and interesting experience. So, all right, well, we'll go on from here. That doesn't sound super negative. It just sounds like esoteric. So then the second time I met him, I was doing interviews for my site, the my former site, now Comics Bulletin. Comics Bulletin, still alive. Um, and I'm a real good friends with the former press agent at Dark Horse Comics, who uh, Darrow did his comic through, um, Ob. And Ob is like, do you want to interview Jeff Darrow? I'm like, sure, no problem. That'll be fun. So I go up to him, nice to meet you. So first of all, he's- And he ta- draws a whale on you. Well, I'm sorry. First of all, he's talking to a couple of other creators who I'm friends with, um, the pa- J- Arnold and Jacob Pander, who are a couple guys from um, Portland who did, uh, who are just really great guys, and did this uh, comic called Grend- Grendel for a while. So, I remember Grendel. Yeah, they yeah, yeah. did. They did the Art Deco era of Grendel. Oh, okay, yeah. The tall, thin woman who. Yeah. Um, so, um, Ob's like, "Oh, you have an interview with Jason," and, and um, Daryl looks at me like, "All right, fine, whatever." He clearly, we just wanted to hang out with his friends and not talk to me. So I go up to, so we go to this space and I get my recorder set up and I'm like, oh, I really enjoy your work. Um, You know, tell me about what you're doing now with Sholin Cowboy. You did a a issue that was mostly text, right? I was reading about that recently. It's like, I don't know what you're talking about. Mm. I I didn't do an issue that was all text. Where, where, Where did this come from? What's going on here? Like, oh, okay, well, this is going sideways. Uh, so, uh, and but you uh, had gotten wrong, or you didn't get wrong. I found out that I had it right, but um, hmm. he just was in the mood to be cranky. And then I asked him another question, and I can't even remember what it was now. And he did 
the metaphorical table turn. He's like, this is a waste of my time. I'm done. Just start stomping away. Whoa. He's done. He's done. Toss over the table and cross his arm and you fucked with me and I'm out of here. Was it the la- uh, was it the only interview of the day? Because that sometimes can may, come to play. It may have been. Yeah. It may have been. And it was my buddy doing me a favor saying, hey, well, you can talk to Darrow. He'll be oh, cool. Yeah. Instead, no, no. And I'm like, well, maybe I can talk to him again and apologize. He's like, no, he's got a very long memory. He's not going <laughs> to... And the third time, I'm telling you, you're going to get a whale drawn on your face. That's what's going to happen next time. <laughs> oh, but I, did I tell you the worst one? Probably my no, worst interview No, but now I want to hear the worst one. So I've done hundreds of interviews, and the most of them go just fine. The worst was Gene Simmons. Oh, you have told me about this. Yeah. Wait, did he, like, lick you with his long tongue? No. Okay. No, that wouldn't have, not, that... That wouldn't have been terrible. <laughs> That Carlos, that would have been a positive. That would have been on a... the streets. They call that <laughs> a lick positive. <laughs> and That's you, a winner. And you know, I know what's on the streets after oh, all. Oh, you sure do. I, I'm, I'm long very tongue hip, licks. Very hip. That's for a what's positive. On the That's a winner. Sorry. So I'm doing what they call a press round table. You have multiple people sitting around the table, right. and you're all throwing questions at the person you're interviewing. So at this table, he's there. He's doing promos for Kiss Meets, Kiss Meets like Batman or something. Oh, jeez. Yeah, I think it was Kiss Meets Batman. So. He probably always already checked out anyhow then. Well, I mean, they, they're doing their thing, and they're yeah. you know, basically they're doing this to get pull quotes for publicity articles and stuff, because this is like press junket in the middle of San Diego Comic-Con. Mm. So I'm sitting with this table, and there's like five or six people here, there, and he sits down. He latches on the face of the woman sitting across from me. He's like, hey, Beyonce, how you doing? What? Like... Oh, nice to see you again. What the hell are you doing here? You was know, Beyonce, you know, by the way, on the other side of the it table? It was not Beyonce. Okay, was, just the, sure. that, would have been a, that would have been a treat, believe yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. Oh, would, that would have been, been a winner. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. She is a winner. A winner. She's a winner. winner. She's a winner. A winner. Okay. So, so is this some random lady that was there? Well, he, I guess he knew her, and she'd okay. asked him some relatively co- tough questions in the past and stuff. But uh, So he spends basically the whole 10 minutes he's sitting at our table just haranguing her. Oh. Hey, Beyonce, what do you care about this shit anyway? You don't know anything about comics. Well, tell me about Jim Steranko. Well, Jim Steranko is a fucking 1960s reference. He's dating himself by bringing up Jim Steranko, mm. but whatever. What do you know about comics anyway? I'm here talking about Batman. You don't know anything about this stuff. What brings you to Comic-Con, Beyonce? And he's going on and on like this for like 10 minutes. And he gets up and I'm like, whoa, this is just fucking uncomfortable. Just yeah. what a... What a nightmare guy. I mean, anyway. Yeah. No, that's a bad experience. That was a bad damn experience. I don't like him after hearing it. So. Did you like him before? Not a lot. Yeah, I didn't think so. I always, I'm not a big Kiss person. Like, a, a ton of people were like, oh, you know, I grew up with Kiss, and they, like, changed my life, and, you know, rock yeah. music. I have, like, a million other rock bands that I like better. You know? Oh, yeah. Like, it's, it just wasn't for me. Like, it wasn't, like, something that really changed me. Their um, 80s stuff is shit. Classic 70s stuff is pretty good. Yeah, it's, it's okay. I mean, it definitely was changing in the fact that it was like what they did was, oh, look at this. We can do this now. And that's kind of cool. But it's like, like but... it was this cool experience to talk to the guys from Kiss. Like Paul Stanley. Yeah, yeah. Paul Stanley, Starman was kind of cool. Totally. Uh, well, we're talking about books and stories. We had talked about something earlier about sci fi and literature and dystopian classes that I took in high school, remember? Yeah, that you're lucky to have that. I had a yeah, science fiction weird? class in high school. So you had a sci-fi fun. class yeah. and I had a dystopian literature class. That's rare. Yeah. What was your uh, assigned books, do you remember, for a sci-fi class? It was all the classics. So like, we read uh, like Ray Bradbury. But Fahrenheit and- 451? No, we read- Like the other stuff. Martian Chronicles. Martian Chronicles, yeah. Which is nice. Like yeah. I look back on it now, it was like a good book, but- didn't, I don't know, maybe too impressed with itself. Yeah, I could see that. I don't know, maybe I'm just not like Ray Bradbury is the god. Well, Friday Night 451 is amazing. Yeah. And that's like How is the present. movie? Oh, it's really good. Is so it? here's a part of the A Lot of Things. In, in a little while, we're going to get to uh, things that we're both into. But this is one out the bat, off the bat. Out the bat? What do the kids uh, say the on the bat? streets? What do the kids say on the streets? Do they say off the bat? Am I supposed to know these things? Here's the thing off the bat. Uh, and it's also a winner, is that uh, the Fahrenheit 451 on it's HBO right now uh, is incredible. It's a really good version of it. Okay. What they did is they updated it and they added social media. Okay. Because it totally fits. Right. If you haven't read the book or seen the show, you should do both. But they the short version is that there's um, firemen 
and they burn books instead of putting out fires. Right. So they're tra- basically trying to kill information and, sh- and stop learning and keep people ignorant and control people. That's like their f- job. Like the new police is to control people. Again, we're not too far from that at times. And what's brilliant about the HBO version is that they added social media. So people were like, yay, likes, likes, smiley faces when they were burning things. So it shows you like how quickly it changed and how people just accepted this like new world order. Oh, that's spooky. Especially yeah. Especially with the political world we're in right now. Yes, which we could also go into. Yeah, we could. But let's stay with books for a minute. I'd rather stay with books for a minute. <laughs> so yeah, so I read 451 and uh, Brave New World in 1984. And uh, The Machine, which no one's read. The Machine. I should look that up, because I remember that in my head. It just remembered. And what were the ones you read? Uh, Time Machine? We read The Time Machine. Martian Chronicles. Um, The Foundation Trilogy. Of course. That's heavy duty, though. Yeah, it was pretty intense. Yeah. We read this guy named Olaf Stapledon, who wrote these completely cosmic sci-fi epics that were pretty, like, psychedelic and mind-blowing. You ever hear of him? Mm Mm-mm. It's like it's like really weird, wild, weird, wild stuff. Weird, wild stuff, kids. Check it out <laughs> on the hour from like the creation of the universe to the destruction of the universe. And Olaf, what's his last name? Staple Don. Staple. Don. There it is. Came up. Star Maker. That's one of them. They're they're like these amazing like galaxy spanning books, and they're just last and first men. But my favorite that we read was Philip K. Dick. Oh right. Are you a Philip K. Dick fan? I mean, yeah. I don't know why I'm not, but I'm... He's probably my favorite writer in the English language. Wow. I'm crazy about Philip K. Dick. Maybe books. I need to be more Philip K. Dickish. That's a quote. I must have read it, Do Android's Dream of Electric Sheep, like, I love a that dozen book. times. Did you see the uh, uh, series on Amazon? Yeah. It's well, pretty no, good. The, you're, you're talking... Um... It's an anthology on Amazon Prime. Oh, yeah. No, I haven't seen any of that. Wait, what did you just say? You, I thought you were talking about. Um, I'm thinking, do do Android dream of electric sheep? Is that not Philip K. Dick? It is. Yeah, yeah, it yeah, is. yeah. That's an Amazon. Oh, series. it's electric sheep or whatever it's called, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I thought you were talking about, um, the one where the Nazis win World War II. Oh no, that's uh the other one. Gosh damn it! Oh my, the man God. in the high castle. The man in the high castle. Yeah, yeah. So no, that... I guess I'm not a Philip K. Dick fan if I can't remember the man. You don't in the know what's castle. on the streets, kid. <laughs> you don't know what's a winner. Here's what's a winner. That Electric Dreams though is pretty damn good. Okay. It's not like the book in the, in the sense that it's kind of its own thing a little bit, but man, each one kind of stands on its own. But they all do have that feel like a Twilight Zone, which yeah, like I a... love. How's it compared to Black Mirror? It's um, it's less intense. And there's less stakes. I feel like, okay, it's like Twilight Zone to Tales from the Crypt. Okay. Let me explain. Do I need to explain or do you get okay, that? Okay, I get that. I Twilight get that. Zone has some de- bad endings, but also has some kind of good endings. Mm-hmm. And you like feel like, okay, I'm going to accept what the justice is that's served in this uh, no matter what. And in Tales from the Crypt, I was like, oh, fuck you. Like, they all got their heads cut off. You know uh-huh. what I mean? Like, that's the ending. It's like, it's generally going to be a bad ending. So is Electric Dreams the Tales from the Crypt? Electric Dreams is the Twilight Zone. Okay. And a Black Mirror is a Tales from the Crypt. Because they all lose at the end. Black Mirror, a lot of people lose in the end. Or at least they feel really bad. Like there's a black and white version, going back to black and white, uh, of the second or third season of Black Mirror. It's incredible, but it's like fucking depressing. Uh Uh-huh. And it's so based on like reality. You Uh know, like it's like these, um, you know, the automaton kind of robots that kind of look like dogs that can run around. Like they're chasing people. Oh, I haven't seen that one. Oh, it's intense. But those little dog robots exist. Like they're fucking real. And they chase this girl down because they're, again, 1984, Fahrenheit 451-ish, going against outliers and wanting to shut them down. And because they're so fucking strong in robots, they don't like like stop. They're like, we're going to go get this person. Oh. And that's that episode, you know? Yeah. So that feels like a Tales from the Crypt. It doesn't feel like a, oh, well, now I'm happy after, or now I can sleep well. I can't. Okay. Because that's why I can't watch too much Black Mirror, because like in right. the end. Right. There you go. Yeah. It's, you just, it it's just all like dark and. Well, you know what? It's, it's great, shit. but it's like. Yeah. Yeah. You're... The best one is there's like there's one about uh, people who go on dates, but they're all done for them. And they have like a little house they go to. And it's kind of like an OK Cupid kind of thing. It's like in the future, everybody's kind of matched up with someone, and then you go and like have a little moment and see if you want to like like literally be with them forever. 
and they have like 24 hours to hang out together. Oh, that's, like that's that one good. was kind of cool. Yeah. And it, it didn't have a bad ending, but yeah, that happens a lot with those. Yeah. But you, I think again, both of us are very lucky to have uh, that kind of stuff in school because I, I, it flavored my personality. Did not for you? I always loved sci-fi, but like having a class where you studied it was like, yeah, it totally flavored my personality. Totally like changed my approach to what I was reading too. Because when you're reading something like that in school, it's like this isn't just some cult thing. It's something that's like your English studies, right? Yeah. In some way, some level, it's like Shakespeare and Charles Dickens because you're reading. Something that's sanctioned by your teacher that you're going to write essays about. You can have class discussions on the Martian Chronicles. Yeah. Or a, a cosmic Olaf, Olaf Stapledon. I wrote him down. I'm going to check him out. I can't. I haven't read it since high school, but. Which you should. Oh, I was supposed to look up the machine. The machine is another one of those ones, like Olaf, where you're like, you you know, you picked it up because the teacher told you to. Uh huh. But then you're like, um, uh, oh, that's funny. I typed in the machine and I got. <laughs> which I've been talking about today, Burt Kreischer, who's like this comedian, stand-up comedian, who just released a special on Netflix. It's out right now. He wrote, uh, he has a whole story about, it's called The Machine, and it's about how he was in Russia, and he basically was part of the Russian mafia for a little while, like helping them, <laughs> like buy booze and stuff. Wow. Yeah, he was like their 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 go-to guy to have fun. If you didn't know, Burt Kreischer. Okay. Uh, he has a, a YouTube video called The Machine, and it's about that story. Is that a guy we want to meet then? Is, can Maybe. He's take in, us out and he's make in sure LA. We have our He's fun? crazy. Um, have you met him? No, I haven't. Okay. Billy Corgan reveals Rage Against the Machine reunion ambitions. That happened a day, a day ago. Uh, no. Oh, a film. There's a film about it. There was a 90s comic called The Machine. Book. Let me put book. Shows shows where my mindset always is. Nineties forever. By the way, the console wars is coming out. When? Remember they're making a movie about the nineties video games. Oh right. Called the console yeah. wars based on the book called the console wars. That would be so interesting, right? Yeah. And I don't know when that's. Maybe it wasn't called the machine. Fuck! I can't find it. I'm sorry, podcast listeners. Okay, I'll look it up as we watch you scroll on your. Well, the video watches a scroll. No, that's true. Audio has it's, no it's, idea. It's compelling. We'll audio, move on. Sure. Uh, I'll look at what that is. I well, so speaking of video games, what's this Game Boy thing? Right. Okay. Well, let's look at this video game. Uh, so you said the, it's not a Game Boy. No, it is not a Game Boy. I have in the studio for video people. Go to youtubecom slash c slash a lot of things to see what I'm about to Don't do. Don't forget the c. Don't forget the c because it means channel or Carlos. Chan uh, channel Carlos. <laughs> channel Carlos. So uh, this is a thing I picked up in Portland. And it's called Go Gamer Portable, and the website is My Arcade Gaming, which is so generic. Yeah. And I picked it up because it's one of those things where it's a portable game system that has a bunch of games on it. And you've probably seen these out. They, they exist. But this one's interesting because I'm wondering, like, how do the developers of these games get paid? Like, this is a $30 device. Maybe, maybe I paid $30 for it. And there's, like, a million games on here. Did they royalty free kind of like just pick games that are already free and put them on here did they have developers that they pay like next to no money just to get this uh system out how does this work if you're listening to the podcast let me know what's your theory i don't have one my okay i guess my theory is that these games exist somewhere else and they just put them on this little device are they real games like you're, let's see can you play metroid and no they're not like in that way oh there you go. Oh, it's got the old school music. So it's starting up with Family Sport, and I didn't pick Family Sport, but I can play it by hitting A button. Ooh, it's got tennis. I do like tennis. Okay. I'm just going to start a quick tennis game and see if it's playable. Oh, you hear the I'll pause. Yeah, uh, the video can't see it. I do polite. Po polite. I think they said final set as soon as I started, <laughs> which means we're almost done. Um, okay, so I have no avatar. Uh, I just have a bouncing ball. Is it color? Yeah, it's color, but I have a, I have a bouncing ball, and I'm fighting, and oh, I have no avatar. that's not terrible graphics. It's not terrible, but I have no avatar. That's hilarious. There's no character of me. So how do I tell where I'm hitting the ball? You, yeah. Look, well, you're returning it. I don't know how I did so well. <laughs> okay, we'll stop this. Um, so the, my quick version and assessment for the audio listeners is there's um, different sections. One's called Mini Fighter. One's called Education. One's called Mini Game. <laughs> One's called Education. Education. We should go to that. Table tennis, bowling, a lot of sports. Uh huh. And they do like seem like all the same graphics, which are like Wii esque. Um, and I feel like they're all going to be like okay to play. 
But uh, still amazed that this is made. Oh, there's a kart racing game, like Mario Kart. Oh. It looks pretty much like Mario Kart. It looks so much like Mario Kart. This is terrible for audio. We're stopping. Ooh, it's pretty bad. Okay, I'm stopping. So this, <laughs> that's called Go Gamer. It's at myarcadegaming.com. You know what? Here's the thing. If you're on a bus, which I take the Bolt Bus a lot, which I highly recommend, if you're going on the West Coast, uh, it's great, super cheap, and I take it when I go to Portland and Vancouver. When I go on that, this kind of device, not bad. You want to kill a couple hours? Play some education or tennis games? <laughs> oh, educate you real good. Hey, 30 bucks. I think it's worth it. I just, I'm afraid for the developers. Did they I'm make gonna, any money? I think I'm going to order one. You're going to order one? I'm going to order one. Why not? They do sell them in stores sometimes. I don't take like Bolt Bus, though. You should. I would like to. Get off the car business. I know you're a big car guy, but... I hate driving. Oh. I hate driving. It's the worst. Well, then... You don't drive here. I don't do any driving. Yeah. You are so lucky. Am I? Yes, you are. Am I? Well, aside from having to take Uber or... Yeah. Tonight, as as n- many of you know, I'm in Seattle. We're on Capitol Hill in a studio. I'm in West Seattle now. If I take buses, it'll be forever. If I don't, it might be twenty five dollars or some crazy shit. Uh-huh. So, so is it forever? Is it worth, yeah, or oh. is it twenty five bucks? Right. Either way, it's not a good decision. It's not a, yeah. So much for our structure, by the way. The structure of the window. We're, I'm bringing it back online. We talked about a video game that has <laughs> no relevance, <laughs> but I wanted to show it off, and the video got to see it kind of. And I'll put a video in the uh, show notes of this games that I was playing, so it, you can see what it was. It is just a lot of stuff. It's a lot of things. It's a lot of things. Let's talk about things Damn that, it. that we're into. And here's a couple of things we're into. You are into BPRD. It's a comic book BPRD. from the 2000s. What started around 2000? Yeah, it was um, well 2004. Or so. so it's a spinoff from the Hellboy universe. Okay. So Hellboy had his buddies Abe Sapien. Um, he had a golem who he's friends with, and uh, Hellboy worked in the BPRD, which is a supernatural investigation group. But should I know what that is? I can't remember what it was. Okay. It stands for something. Bureau of Paranormal Affairs or something. Got it. Whatever it is. Forgot the RD, but got it. Yeah. We got it. Research and develop. Anyway. (laughs) um, But they're great comics. So it's been running since like like for 15 years. Uh, And I've just been... just been streaming it basically it's just been like inhaling the, the series because it's one of the best like just action comics series that i've ever read because it's it's this very central universe and it's got this this core of characters but the things that happen to these characters actually affects them so they're fighting this plague of creatures that are we are we're finding out now have been rising from hell because hell is in rebellion because hellboy has left it mm. Um, and so there's all these bizarre creatures coming up through the Earth's crust, and people are transforming into monsters. And it's got, it takes this tremendous toll on our characters as they try to fight off this invasion. So one of the characters at the center of it's a woman named Liz, who, when she was 13, she discovered she had latent pyrotechnic powers and burned her whole family's house down. Mm. And so she was kind of brought in by the BPRD, and Hellboy became her like surrogate dad. Um, so a lot of the book is about her arc as she learns to live with her powers and accept who she is. And then the end of the first arc, and this is a spoiler, I realize, but whatever. Um, she's able to defeat that phase of the menace, but only by effectively like burning out her mind and destroying her place in the world and just basically completely fucking herself up. Mm. So now she's become this very subtle supporting character in the second arc where just small things happen to her. But these creatures that, that, are in the story are these they're, they're like nothing I've ever seen larger they're, than the life kind of style well they're literally like 40 foot large yeah. uh, like lobster and crab looking creatures with these bizarre faces I'm seeing Godzilla in my head for some it's reason it's not it's not Godzilla as much not as it's his own crazy thing okay. it's the same size but there's a different kind of proportions in a way um, and they're destroying the earth like 
Seattle gets destroyed in a storyline, and they continue to have that be just a, an element in the story. Right. That sounds like Godzilla to me. Yeah, By the way, maybe. <laughs> I see Godzilla literally smashing Seattle in my head when you're talking about So I'm this. not quite selling it as well as I'd like to. No, that's no, fine. But you're saying there's a character development, and that kind of stuff is what drink, draws you into it. Yeah, I mean, like, the threats are interesting. And, like, it goes from everything from, like, demonic possession to these creatures who threaten to literally destroy the planet. A volcano erupts in the middle of Houston. Um, and they have to just basically filled with these creatures. And so the, the whole city is covered in lava. I just finished a storyline where they go to Russia and in... Um, Topical. Yeah. Well, yeah. Let's talk about the election. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they're facing the destruction there, too. And so it be, it's gone from this small story to become this enormous worldwide story, but they never mm. lose the focus on the original characters. And so it's like, I feel like I'm in the middle of season three right now. And you know, like, you know how like you get to season three of like The Wire, and characters reappear who you last saw in season oh, one, yeah, yeah. and you're like, "Holy shit, it's that guy!" And when you say season, it's comics. You said, "Yeah." So, so, but yeah, you, in uh, your streaming, you said that earlier too. But you mean like you're reading? Yeah. yeah okay. I'm yeah. binging. It's funny because like that stuff gets confused now. Like we just like watch content and take in content in so many different ways. I think. Yeah. They were like. Is it Netflix? Is it Hulu? Is it reading? Is it what is it? It's just I think we just take it in. It's all just part of this larger thing now. Doesn't it feel like we like are into media in different ways than we used to? Also, like yeah, and I, I I mean in the positive sense, like we were talking about earlier uh, before the podcast, I am uh, all about evolving and kind of changing who we are as humans and really expanding our abilities, right? And one of those abilities that I test every single day because I'd never sleep is, you know, taking in content and then processing it and understanding it and, and allowing it to help us or change us, you know, in some way. Like, let me give you an example. So if I watch a series, because I'm very um, emotional, like on everything. So if I watch a series and it, it touches me in some way about either be political or introverted or emotional or whatever it is, it literally, when I'm done with it, has kind of modified me. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's the power of a good whatever. Of it a is. good thing, yeah. Of a good. But I think some people don't let it, or almost like they're like, "Oh yeah, that's the thing I watch," and whatever. But uh -huh. they don't like let it like sink in. Do you know what I mean? Like, or they're like, uh, uh, "This is a problem." Doing twelve other things while they're watching it, like they're on their devices, they're doing it, so they're not really like going. I'm all in. Like Legion, I was all in. That was my problem with Legion. Is like it took a hundred percent of my attention. Right. Which and I'd be like, you said problem, but that's what's a good on thing. my phone right now. Right. Huh. You're like, I can't check it because this is amazing. I can't. I can't read my text message. Oh shit! What do I do? And like, actually, in a way, that's like a cool kind of upsetting, right? It's like, well, it's not upsetting to me at all. But yeah, see, for me, I'm all in already. But like, you were like, I can't check my phone. But that, like you said, that's good content. Yeah, yeah, it's it's compelling. It keeps you interested. Yeah. By the way, season two not as good as one though, in my opinion. Okay. What do you think? Did you? They're finish? all sitting on my DVR. Like I watched three episodes of it. It's still three seasons never... or two. It's two. I watched okay. the first three of season one, and like, I love this, and it's not, I I need to find the right time to pay attention to it. That's interesting. Don't you feel like you watch different shows in different ways? No. Interesting. Wait, explain your question, and then I'll say no again. So there's certain shows, for example, that are really good for me to watch when I'm on the treadmill at the gym. No, it's still my answer, but continue. So I can I can pay a certain amount of attention to that show, and I'll get enough out of it where I won't feel like I missed anything. Yeah. Especially like, like a reality show. So this is off your beat. What's a reality show that you'd watch? So this is off your beaten path? Oh, I'm way off the path. I can't even see your path anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you started talking about reality shows, and I'm in a forest. So, like, there's a Netflix show I really like called Last Chance You, which is about community college football teams. Okay. Um, there's three seasons of it. Seasons one and two take place in a small school in Alabama. And it was vaguely uh, notorious for a little while because what happens to the, some of the characters in season two, is it goes off the rails. Season three takes place in this small uh, school in Kansas. And basically, it's the coach and his players, and it's this tiny little school, um, and they actually do like recruitment, like major colleges do. And in the cases of these schools, they bring in people who either rejected from their school, they went to major colleges and are really talented, but for whatever reason, they fucked up, or they're small town kids who are looking to just do something with their lives and have a good time. And the coach is bigger than life, and he swears he's from Compton, and he's in the middle of 
freaking Kansas, mm-hmm. small town Kansas. And he's got this mix of people on the show. And the football is interesting because they have weekly, you know, chances to, to show their worthy or whatever. Yeah. But what's really compelling is the people on the show who are these characters who become surprising. Like the there's the quarterback who was a big time college recruit and incredibly talented, but just doesn't have the motivation. And as the show goes on, we find out all about his family and the weird dysfunctional life he lived. Not weird, actually very normal dysfunctional life he lived in the inner city himself and how his family was deeply loving of him, but he also felt completely rejected by the world outside him. Mm. And so like when these shows are done right, when these sorts of reality shows are done right, you get to learn more about yourself because you're seeing yourself yeah. in these people who honestly like I probably would have never talked to him if I were to meet the guy but I feel like he's someone who's changed my life in some way well that's great and I think that what the problem is is that when why, why I was in a forest and you were on the other path is in the beginning is because you said reality show and I think that we need to stop using because like that has the big brother connotation real world stuff and I think people when you hear a reality show they think that right yeah but here's the thing I'm about to tell you about a series as well that I'm into and it is similar where in the fact that it's talking about humanity it's talking about stories and it, it's something that when you can relate to someone you didn't know you could relate to it helps you and changes you and you know and modifies your behavior and ideas so I think that's great it's 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 almost like that docu series. If you call docu- it docu series, yeah, it just makes it more like digestible for people. Yeah. I think reality show people just get checked out and they think of The Bachelor or something, you know. But what you said sounds compelling, and that seems cool, you know. Yeah. It, it, What's it, it called again? Last Chance You. Last Chance You. Okay. Three seasons, like eight on? episodes each on Netflix. Netflix. Oh, then it's easy. You've got Netflix. It's already. Yeah. Available. So to me, that was like ideal gym re- gym watching. Yeah. Okay. Oh, like, so we're back to that. Yeah. So you watch that so in the that's gym. The, that's the point. Like, it, it's like I can get involved with it as I want to, but there's bits I can like can mentally yeah, skip yeah. over. You know what I can't miss, which is funny, and this I've never said on the podcast, but I am, I don't think I have. Thank you. Thank you. I feel special bringing that out of you. Oh. <laughs> okay. Now it's a special moment. Uh, you hit it here first. Here's the YouTube clip fresh off just for this one moment. So you think you can dance. Uh huh. One of my favorite shows ever, ever, really? ever. And I'll explain why, and we'll get back to what we're talking about. It's but okay. This is a good. I watch every season. I think there's what thirteen or fourteen now. Except I didn't watch the season where the fucking children were on it because fuck that season. Uh huh. No one wants to see children doing contemporary dance. I'm sorry, parents. No one wants to see children doing contemporary dance. If you watch a lot of contemporary, you know what I mean. Uh huh. Uh, so that show is amazing, and it is also about those stories, about these young people figuring it out, but also creating something in the moment. And here's why I watch it. It's not about the competition. I don't give a shit who wins. It's about people realizing they want to do something with their life and express themselves in some sort of artistry, and dance is art. And what they do, lots of times for me, I'm a big contemporary fan, they'll get a choreographer on that show, and they're new to this shit. They've kind of pulled it off. They got here somehow. And they, like a Sonia Tai or something, will or Mia Michaels, will pull something out of these people and make them emotional. Uh-huh. And they'll make them like, I didn't even know I could do that. You know? Like, what other art form has that? Like, where, like, the teacher comes in and says, like, I don't know if that happens in art or, or in fine art or in, in – in book writing, you know, in novel writing or something. Yeah, it does. Does it? It does. Where someone our, goes like... Our friend Steve has been talking about this. He wrote a novel, and his editor came back with some really smart notes. And for the last week, he's been raving about how this is totally making my story tighter and not suddenly I have more empathy for these characters. Because when you have the right person give you feedback, mm. then suddenly it's just not... They help you see everything objectively and bring it to a whole different level. Right. Is yeah. that what you're talking about? I think so. I think so. Help you get closer to your vision by bringing in an external... It, it, it's that, but it's also the guidance part of it. Because they like Sonia Taya, who's one of my favorite choreographers, Like she's been doing it forever, and she also has a very unique style. So by br- her bringing her style and her experience to the you know younger kids or whatever, like they, they, they find something in themselves that they didn't know was there. And I think that's very unique to dance because... I can't think of other ones that do it. Like what you just said makes sense where an editor will be like, hey, this is 
some things you could think about, and all of a sudden their mind becomes a fire, and they come up with this all whole other thing, you know, and that's pretty great. That's similar, but this one is so intense because they're literally doing it with, and this is not an ad for the show. You can watch it. It's on the television. <laughs> but they literally are doing it with another person who's also doing it for the first time. Uh-huh. Like So they're like, all the things we talk about, all the things that I want to do in this world, commune with people, learn, grow, evolve. They're doing it together in that moment for the first time. And when they hit it and they hit this amazing choreography, which makes them feel emotional. And lots of times I've seen them cry, just like fucking lose their shit because they like didn't know they could do it. But they also like tapped into these emotions they didn't know about. And they're done. It doesn't even matter what the score is. Like it doesn't matter what the fucking competition is. They created something magical. And a lot of times the judges will say that. They'll be like, I don't give a fuck. I'm just happy to be in the room when that happened. So that's why I watch that show. When I say like to the layman, just regular person, like, hey, I like that show. You think so? You think you dance? They can think of Dancing with the Stars. Mm-hmm. They think of other competition shows. I'm telling you, that show is different. This show is uh. different, and that's why I watch literally every episode. And and the bringing it back around is I couldn't watch that in the treadmill. Okay, because I'd have to like be into every single performance and not miss a beat on the the performance. I would have never thought of that about that show. <laughs> well, uh, that's, wow! I'm giving you a little wow insider, Carlos, and also uh, insider. So you think you dance? So it's, it's not anything about dance. It's the transformation. It's a transformation and the connection. And a, I love contemporary dance. I like hip hop as well. I, when they do the new stuff, they're doing so many different new styles of, of dance. So do you feel that, that with any other art when you're paying attention to it, listening to certain music or anything, or is it the the fact that you saw them? Go through the transformation. I think that it's harder to do it with music. So I do music as well. And when you do a record or do songs, all unless you're doing a documentary behind the scenes, you don't know that story. Right. You just hear Drake's new album, to go back to him. And I love Drake's new album. I also like Travis Scott's new album. If you all listen and check out Travis Scott. Um, both of those albums, I have no idea what their fucking story was. I just know that hot track that fucking blows the jams or whatever. Uh-huh. But I don't know what... You know what I mean? So it can't with music for me, unless I like do some YouTube research. See, that's what I like about doing this historical research in comics. Bringing because, it back to the book, because then you like, because I can see something on multiple levels. Because mm. it's what came before, and you 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 have that with your music, with love of music too, right? You can appreciate it in its time and why it's unique for what you're listening to now, like. You see what's special about it. We're talking about music. So I was just listening yesterday. Okay, another older reference. Uh, Beastie Boys, Paul's Boutique. Such a good record. Right? It's young, amazing. Young people listen to that record. It's on Spotify for free, if you have Spotify. It's fucking great. It's fucking amazing, yeah. right? But the more I learn about it, the better it gets. Oh, like the story behind it. The story behind yeah. it. Because like the Beastie Boys were seen as this novelty act, right? Right. Uh, and they weren't taken seriously by anybody. Yeah. And they come out with this album that's just like this incredible sample machine. And they're just, the the rhymes are just so tight and they sound so great and everything's got such power. And then these tracks were already pre-existing by some dub producer of the time. So they just, they created the, these uh, words to sit on top of the music. So it was this this thing where oh, I don't think I knew that part. Yeah, it's this thing where they kind of took it and turned it into something else, and then it's like literally all samples. There's no actual music being played there, also. So I think that makes it more interesting. And then there's this other element, which is that it samples from everything, like the Beatles and all these other bands who they could never get samples for because it would have been phenomenally expensive. And so that makes it interesting too. And so like, it's great for what it is, but with all the other stuff on top of it, it just makes it so much more interesting. Yeah. I mean, it, it like, it tapped into jazz, it tapped into funk and disc. It just felt like a whole experience. There, There's a, there's a little tiny sample they do from Le Freak. Oh yeah, which like ties everything back to New York circa nineteen late nineteen seventies, yeah, and like grounds it perfectly in their era. And there's a freaking banjo song in the middle oh, of it. Oh, that's right. That's like comes yeah. out of nowhere. Let's listen to. I mean, this. I don't think copyright. If I play it like for fifteen seconds, but this song is one of my favorites on the record. I just remembered if the podcast could pick it up. Um, I do this rarely, but oh yeah. Oh, I skipped it. YouTube. Ah. Uh. It's 
as loud as I can get. It's just that rah, 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 the sample in the background. Yeah. Hell you were. All right. Okay. That's beautiful. High Plains Drifters is that song. Uh, Paul's Boutique. Plains, Plains Drifter. Drifter. Okay. So listen to Paul's Boutique. And also, by the way, I have a funny story real quick I'll tell you. And then we have one more thing and we're done. Because this podcast is fucking over already. <laughs> it happens that fast. This is what wow, happens to the show. It's oh, already an hour. An hour yeah. I, w- I have one more show to tell you about, but I want to talk about BC Boys because you got me on there and I want to end on Donnie Darko. Okay. This is all over the place. It's not really 100%. Structure. <laughs> Who needs structure? Listen, uh, all right, don't get me started with Artie because Artie will come out at any moment. <laughs> I have a BC Boys uh, uh, story I've never told on the podcast. So now I'll tell it because you've put me in this position. I went to Lollapalooza. I want to say it's 95, a while ago, right? It was my first Lollapalooza, and I was driving with Beastie Boys um, uh, Ill Communication. I believe that's what it is, right? Yeah. License to Ill is the first album. Ill Communication is that third or fourth or whatever it is. Check your heads fourth. Anyways, Ill Communication. It's like a newer record at the time. It was on cassette. We had it, a green cassette. I remember green. Uh Uh-huh. And we were playing the shit out of it, having a good time, dancing uh, in the car. And then another car comes up alongside us. They're like, what are you listening to? And we're like, we're bumping that new Beastie Boys. It's just the hottest. And they're like, oh, shit. We didn't bring any tapes on this long drive. What's wrong with them? Yeah. We forgot them for some reason, or he left and blah, blah. Can you we borrow it? Because <laughs> there's no digital, right? And we're like, sure, what the f- why not? You know? So, we're like, throw it over here. So, we literally, while driving slowly, because it was traffic, we threw it through our out of our window <laughs> into their car. They caught it, they put it in their fucking cassette thing, and they started blamming the you know, communication. And we're like, this, and like, we, they were blaming it loud enough that we could hear it. You know what I mean? And so, like, we're having a good time. And then at some point, I don't know what the fuck's wrong with those young people. We just didn't get it back from them because <laughs> we had tons of, of other course, cassettes, yeah. you know? We just, like, gave it to them. Keep it. Keep whatever. It. So they had fun, blah, blah, blah. And then along the way, it goes the line, and we're having a lot of traffic. And all of a sudden, we bump into the car in front of us, like, kind of fast, like oh. a crash almost. Oh, shit. And then we feel a person crash behind us, and then we hear other crashes in front of us. Oh. Six car pile up. Oh, no. We're all fine. It was just because we weren't moving too fast, but yeah. someone like put on their brakes, you know? Mm-hmm. So we all roll to the side, have the cop come, do all the fucking bullshit. And uh, at the time, I was selling FEMO like beads and like necklaces because <laughs> I did FEMO making of jewelry. This is a thing that I did. <laughs> okay. And so I had a ton of it in the trunk, and the cop, I remember, was, like, writing this information on the trunk, and I was like, don't look in the trunk. He's going to see all the FEMO that I'm selling at Lollapalooza. <laughs> I don't think he would have cared. So that's happening, whatever. Then we finally, like, start meeting the people who are in this accident because they're like, walking up the line. And, of course, one of the cars is the people that we gave the cassette to. And they're like, what the fuck? What are the odds? <laughs> and I was like, how's your car? And she's like, it's fine. And we all sound like Jerry Seinfeld. <laughs> well, and also, here's your cassette back. Thanks. <laughs> you got anything else we can listen to? <laughs> yeah, I think we might have given him another cassette. Yeah. Come listen to this Jesus Jones. Oh, EMF. EMF. Do you remember that? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay, we're done with that. Here's a series you should watch, Dark Net. It's on uh, Showtime. Oh, I've been I've falling seen in that. love with Showtime recently. I just canceled you my watched... Showtime. Oh, did you? Yeah. I got it for Twin Peaks a while ago. Canceled it. Got it back for Sasha Baron Cohen's um, Who is America show. I heard that's amazing. I haven't seen any of that. Really just good. The, just the things they've shown on the shows. He literally has, he shows people's true colors, you know, and it's ridiculous. Like, there's a person who literally, he goes, hey, we should pretend to be a quinceanera. Like, you know, Mexican girls, bur- you know, yeah. coming out of being a woman thing party. And you're going to dress up as a woman, A, and you're going to have a fake... Vagina. I can say that. This is an explicit podcast. Okay, so, and then you're going to, like, lure in people who shouldn't be here because they, you know, illegal Mexicans, and then we're going to, like, drug them or something. Wow. And then we're going to deport them, right? You, you, the first part you say no to. You know, maybe dressing up as a young girl, maybe say no to that. The second part you definitely say no to, putting on a fake vagina. <laughs> yes. They say yes to both of these until the cops show up, and then the cops are like, what are you doing? He's like, he said I should. (laughs) Wow. 
Yeah, that show. But I got it for uh, 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 other reasons. They have incredible, like, old movies that you've forgotten about, great documentaries, and this is a series everybody needs to watch this. It's got a terrible name. I'm going to tell the producers right now. Dark Net. Dark Net makes you think of, like, you know, what's it called? Uh, Silk Road and all the really bad shit that happens on the dark web. Yeah, dark web. Dark, it's not that. Yeah. It's really great series. The last one I watched was on uh, a robot called Pepper, which I've met in Japan. Pepper's like a really cool robot who's in stores and stuff, and you can own a Pepper. It's like an individual robot you can have in your home. And so this it, the story was about a family who had Pepper, and the story was also about a woman who lost someone and turned his text messages into a chatbot. Oh, and I thought that was brilliant and beautiful. And the whole episode was incredible. And I was uh. like, where has this show been in my whole life? It's probably been hiding behind a terrible name, Darknet. I wouldn't have went and looked for it. I would have never expected a show like with a name like that to have an episode about someone saving their loved one's oh, messages. It's beautiful. It's, it's season two, episode eight is the one I just talked about. It's so good. That sounds Darknet. really nice. Yeah. Okay, let's end on Dark. Donnie Darko. Donnie Darko. What a classic. We both watched the film. It's been a few years, but I love the movie. I love the movie. What were we talking about it? The sad part that uh, his his whole thing in that movie was... We all die alone. We all die alone. And should we spoil it? If you haven't seen Donnie Darko, stop Stop now. listening for like two or three minutes, and then we'll do an ending. Do a skip ahead. And okay, then... so real quick spoiler. The ending is, he basically, the movie is about him creating a parallel reality. And he creates this bubble universe accidentally. And in that universe, things are wrong, and things are not happening the right way they should. And the only way he can, like, literally get rid of that reality is by dying. Because he has to kill his alternate version of himself so that it doesn't exist in this other reality so that other reality can survive. That's a lot to take, but the point is, the whole time he's worried about dying alone, which I think we all can think of that, even if we have a special someone, and the sad thing is that he does die alone. He has to die alone. But does he actually die? The, an airplane jet engine falls on him. Right. Do you think he survives? Well, <laughs> which one of him- Donnie Darko 2. Which one of him survives, though? Oh, right. I- so the okay, go ahead. Okay, so this is this is my theory, is that we have ourselves and we have ourselves inside our head, right? There's the objective Carlos is sitting across the table from me. Okay, and there's the Carlos who's inside, who's between your ears. Okay, and it's the you inside your ears is like this perception of yourself that doesn't necessarily match who you are. It's Ooh. just your your view of yourself, right? Because like just like how you see yourself in the mirror, and you're like. Do I actually look like this? You hear your voice, and I'm like, right, like, that but, kind of thing. But is that objective version your version of that objective version? Because remember, we all have our own reality bubbles, and so which I'll post a drawing that I did when I was a kid about reality bubbles. But your objective version of me isn't going to be Joe Schmo's objective version, is right? It? No, because there's all, no pure objective version. It's all subjective. It's all subjective. As someone who's written history, I can tell you, it's all subjective. So what it really is is a subjective version and my in my head version. No, there is. I mean, there is reality. Because, is there? Well, okay. Oh, we're gonna get into yeah, it. Get super fucking deep. This here. is not the end of the podcast material, but <laughs> we have five minutes at the very most to discuss true reality. If you have a traffic camera sitting above a street, right, and it, and it films an accident, yeah, that's the objective reality of an accident. Now, I, as the driver of a car in an accident, may see it a whole different way than the camera sees it. That's my subjective reality. The camera is not lying. But what there makes, is no fake news. But what makes your version diff, not as legit as the, as the camera version? Because that's what I'm perceiving from inside my own two eyes. But why is that not as, my as little head. legitimate as a outsider? The camera, you could, you could argue that the camera is subjective as well. The way that it was filmed, the way that it recorded it, the granularity. Anyone who watches sports and has seen instant replays look different from different angles will right. tell you that's true. So then the cameras are subjective as well. Maybe his maybe his knee didn't touch the ground. Oh wait, it actually did. But there is a subjective. There is an objective reality. We all know there is. I don't. I, I don't have know a, there is. I have an actual amount of money in my bank account. I have an actual number of fingers. If I think I have ten thousand dollars in the in the bank and I don't, and I think I have six fingers and I have five. That's reality. There's mm. no there's no ambiguity there. 
you have a physical space that you go home to and sleep in, that's reality. But you can perceive it as being a great place or a crappy place or... Well, believe me, I am actually all for the idea of absolute truths, and I always wanted to talk about it on the show when we haven't had the chance to. So I believe that there are absolute truths, which is similar to a objective reality. Uh -huh. They're kind of in that same vein. They are farther reaching because they're about morality and about the universe and bigger things. Uh, so I'm with you on part of it. But at the same time, I think of perception being so huge because you can be literally with no money and think that you're fine or a rich man in friends or in experience and whatever so the fact that you have not ten thousand dollars but you feel like you have ten thousand dollars it, it can almost equal that out i mean you can't like buy a new house with no money but with along the lines of visualization and the ideas of like thinking about things positively that house might come out and appear in a different way that you didn't think, but not necessarily because you had the money in the bank, right? So there is something to be said about how you perceive the world affecting the world. Yeah. That is also equal to the literal money that you might have in an account or the literal place you go to sleep at night. I really believe if you think you can do the things you want to do in life, they'll happen for you if you're driven and, and work hard enough at it. I mean, I could go. I can go on on this more. I, I think a... we got it. Okay. I mean, we don't, but I think for <laughs> now we got it. Jason, it's been a pleasure. Uh, I think we hit all the main points we want to do. And any last thing you're into before we go? Uh, did you talked about the comic? Uh, check that out. BPRD. Uh, it's on the on the comics apps. You get the apps. Yeah, Comicsology. It's on Comicsology and and check out if you haven't watched any Darko. Some of our younger Don, listeners Don, haven't. Uh, by the way, that director. That's his best movie, in my opinion. It's literally an incredible film you can rewatch. A lot of his other films, not so much, but yeah. check that movie out. And my book, The American Comic Book, yes. the American Comic Book Chronicles, you can read excerpts of it from my publisher website, tomorrows at T-W-O-M-O-R-R-O-W-S dot com. Just search for it, and uh, you can read uh, some nice excerpts. It's a beautiful book, and it'll be cool if you buy it. You should buy it, and it's probably, how much is it, by the way? It's forty six dollars, so it's not what a weird cheap. number. That's, not cheap, that's but a, yeah. I think it's worth it. I'm Is really, there any sort I mean, of Amazon discount or something? I, you know, I've heard that Amazon sells for less than cover price. <laughs> it might be a thing they do. They might do it. You might check it on the Amazon. <laughs> also, uh, we're gonna go. We should go to the Amazon store and film it and see if we can see it on the shelf. Okay, because that'd be fun. Okay, uh, and also and check we're not out... too far from Elliott Bay Books. It'd be cool oh if no, we can go right there. And then um, I wanted to. I forgot this because we were talking about comic books. Just half a second. The End of the Fucking World. Did you ever watch that? Oh, I never watched it. It's the comic cool. is amazing. The comic's really good, and I didn't finish it, but I, I like perused it, you know? And I was like, oh, this is something I would like. And I didn't, I was like looking at it at a bookstore. And I was like, oh man, I should buy it. And then I came home, and Netflix literally was like, we're making the series. Is it worth watching? It's really good. Okay. So, any everybody listening, uh, I won't mention it on the solo version. So, this is my mentioning of it. The End of the Fucking World, which is asterisked out because you can't say fucking. Right. People, by the way, calm down. I think they, I think they get it. It's I, really good. I'm it's actually really a, good. I'm actually a Patreon supporter of his, and I'm reading his new oh. book as it's coming out called Otoma. A U T O M A. I'm writing that down. Uh, Charles Forsman's the creator. He's not selling them. He's just making them available to Patreon subscribers. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, damn. So he's he's putting them out now, and then when it gets collected, I'll have this kind of rare. Cool That's thing. cool. Uh, and it's really good. It's really brutal. Super brutal, very but intense. I guess what it is, uh, I, yeah, it, he can be intense and brutal, but I saw what they did with the Netflix is they kind of tamed it down a bit. Oh, it takes the fucked up pro the characters and gives them real heart. The the, the graphic novel or yeah, the series? The the graphic novel. Yeah, well, then the series does the same thing. Yeah. Because I felt like attached to these people even though it was like intense stuff. Yeah. Like he wanted to like kill motherfuckers and you're like, oh, I get where he's coming from, but also he's got heart and... Yeah, I've been there. I've been. Uh... <laughs> I've been there. I had the knife. <laughs> <laughs> I held it at someone's throat. Now that didn't happen. The end of the How fucking world. Know? Check out NFX. How do you know okay, that's happen. another podcast. Uh, Jason, where are you on the internet? Uh, social medias? You don't do this stuff, do you? Uh, at Jason Sachs on the Twitters, but I'm not a big Twitter guy. S A C K S. S A C K S. I'm Owenawa. O N A W A. Uh, a lot of things. Pod is our Twitter. 
This is Springfield Confidential. You should check out this book by Mike Rice. It's fucking incredible. I also have a cupcake on the table, uh, and it's from Cupcake Real. And if you're in Seattle, go to Cupcake Real. Oh, look uh, at that. They're in the really room. incredible. Yeah. And I've, man, I fucked that and up. And I got to get one of these things. They're, I don't know what they're called. I forgot it. Mine That's are- it. The episode's over. Uh, we might do another thing. Uh, stick around for the YouTube because we might have another thing. But other than that, I'll see you later. Jason, thanks for being here. It's fun.